Okay. All right, so uh, hello everyone. We're very happy to uh, have you here, especially John, Professor John McCumber, who's uh, going to talk today about philosophy and the Cold War. Just a very briefly a heads up, this lecture is going to be recorded. So uh, if you have, are sharing your screen and if you have the camera turned on, you might be aware that there might be, uh, you might be part of this. We are not going to record the discussion later on, but uh, for now, everything is going to be recorded. Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome Professor McCumber. Professor McCumber is um, distinguished professor at the University of California, Los Angeles at the Department of European Languages and Transcultural Studies. And I want to point out out of his numerous publications, uh, only two books that are relevant for the thematic coherence here. The first one is Time in the Ditch, American Philosophy and the McCarthy Area, Era, which was published in 2000 by Northwestern Press. And recently in 2016, The Philosophy Scare, The Politics of Reason in the Early Cold War. Uh, published by the University of Chicago Press. And that being said, Professor McCumber, you have the word. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, philosophical lessons from the Cold War. It's like the other things that I've done in this area is not fun, it's not pleasant, but uh, I think it should be looked at. Uh, history will not have lessons for philosophers until philosophers decide that they want to learn them. This decision requires reflecting not only on historical facts, but on the nature of philosophy itself. So before philosophers can learn any other lessons from history, lessons say about free will or direct reference, they must first see if philosophy has anything to teach them or sorry, if history has anything to teach them about the nature of philosophy itself. At this point, we can adapt an argument of Aristotle's to show that it does. Aristotle argued that to claim that philosophy is not necessary for life is itself a philosophical argument. And so philosophy is necessary for life. Similarly, to argue that philosophy cannot or need not learn from history requires historical self-reflection on the part of philosophers, and so requires them to learn from history. That history has no lessons for philosophers is itself a lesson of history for philosophers. So historical reflection has lessons for philosophers that should engage in it. And first and foremost, those lessons concern the nature of philosophy itself. Now in a couple of books and some articles, I have reflected on the period of American history that is commonly called the McCarthy era. And the lessons that that era may be able to teach us about mainly analytical philosophy, the dominant philosophical approach in America and the general English speaking world. I think that word dominance used often, I think it's a tip off that something's going on. Uh, today, I would like to take up some lessons about the history of the Cold War, that the history of the Cold War has for philosophers about the nature of continental philosophy, the other big paradigm in the field these days. The history, uh, the part about the Cold War is gonna be largely confined to the United States where the Cold War was uh, different from other countries. The lessons, the philosophical lessons to be taken from it I think are more general. So I want to talk first in, in, about what happened in the United States. Uh, it's the McCarthy era is usually dated from 1950 when Joseph McCarthy, recently elected senator from Wisconsin, began claiming publicly that communists had infiltrated many institutions of American life and government. It ended says the standard view, in about 1954, when McCarthy was censured by his colleagues in Congress. And then a couple of years later, 
he died of cirrhosis of the liver. So that was the end of it. Uh, if you take this attitude, it enables you to dismiss the McCarthy era as a mere episode, an interlude of American craziness after which things return to normal. I'm afraid a lot of people still have that view. It was articulated in 1978 by Nathan Pusey, who was the president of Harvard University from 1953 to 1971. Uh, and he, he showed, I mean, he did this dismissal for higher education. Uh, quote him, quote from him. Admittedly, he writes, not all responsible groups stood firm against the storm. We have already seen that some of the regents of the University of California failed to do so, but a sufficient number did to ensure the vitality of higher education in the United States and to enable it to continue to grow. Uh, the problems with this quote are just massive. Uh, the implied equation of vitality and growth in higher education. I mean, the bigger it gets, the better it is, and I don't, I'm not so sure. Uh, the way he singles out the University of California at the other end of the country and a public institution uh, to point out, uh, you know, as a bad example of what happened. And when he says that the regents failed to stand firm against the tide, that's not true. The regents were an enthusiastic part of the tide. They were working as hard as they could on behalf of getting rid of professors. Uh, only some of those professors were in, intended to be communists. They just wanted to get rid of anybody who was obstreperous. And I'll come back to that. A few years later, Henry Wolsowski, who was Harvard's Dean of Arts and Sciences from uh, 1973 to 1984, just succeeding Pusey, put it differently. Uh, here's a quote from him. During the 1950s, a number of Harvard instructors and assistant professors became victims of McCarthy-style political pressures. Some appointments were prematurely rescinded. A few left voluntarily, in quotes, rather than facing investigation of their political opinions or affiliations. The same was true everywhere else. And I do not recall that their elders organized an effective defense anywhere. So we see that the historical distance is a precious thing. Uh, Pusey says nobody resisted. Uh, sorry, Pusey says a few people didn't resist. And uh, uh, Rosowski says nobody resisted it. I think uh, Rosowski was right. I have come to believe that the very name McCarthy era is offensive nonsense. Now, you know, it's in the subtitle of my first book on this. Uh, it's nonsense, it's hogwash because it relegates anti-communist hysteria in the United States to a short period just after World War II and to the activities of just one man in Washington, DC. The anti-communist hysteria of the times did quiet down, not right after McCarthy died, but you know, within a, within a decade maybe. Uh, it quieted down, but it remained a serious factor in American life long after his death. And even today, right-wing politicians uh, are often quick to label somebody or some approach as Marxist or socialist in order to discredit it. We see this in the debate about critical race theory today. Uh, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene just uh, last March referred to Joe Biden's communist Green New Deal. So there's a communism as environmentalism or environmentalism as communism. So it's still going on. So I don't call it the McCarthy era anymore. I don't like that. I prefer to just call it the opening phase of the Cold War. Cold War lasted for 40 years. It didn't last for four. This hysteria uh, had profound and lasting effects on American society. The United States was not only the leader of one side in the Cold War, its internal stance with regard to that war uh, was qualitatively different from those of its allies. Other Western countries generally saw the Cold War as a foreign conflict, taking the attitude that while political affairs from abroad, that is to say from the 
what called itself the socialist world, was to be fought, domestic communism was not in itself an issue. Their own citizens were free, pretty free, openly to pursue Marxist goals, although, of course, they should use democratic means to achieve them. In the United States, the Cold War was domestic. The American left came to be defined, and in some areas is still defined, as a mortal threat to America itself. The result was a vast mobilization against domestic communism, which was called the enemy within, that was a major book at the time, as well as against anything, in the words of the UCLA student newspaper at the time, that quote, might faintly resemble communism. This mobilization went far beyond matters of governance and politics and permanently changed the daily life of every American. The interstate highway system, for example, today binds the country together economically and is commonly used by Americans just to navigate around their own cities and towns. But its congressional authorization was entitled the quote, National Interstate and Defense Highway Act of 1956. Part of its stated purpose was to facilitate the rapid movement of troops and equipment around the country in the event of Soviet attack. Similarly, the American television networks, which quickly came to dominate the country's popular culture, were set up, they were governmentally set up. The, most Americans don't know that in part to disseminate government announcements to the American citizenry, in, again, in case of Soviet attack. So given the magnitude of these and other changes, it is perhaps no surprise that the quote, faint resemblances, unquote, to communism, which were targeted in the American version of the Cold War, went far beyond left-wing politics. It has been documented, and I've got references from other people here, documented that much of the hysteria gripping the United States at the beginning of the Cold War, while rhetorically couched in terms of anti-communism, in fact had other targets. These included Jews, homosexuals, African-Americans, and feminists, all of them. In some cases, these other battles actually took precedence over the battle against communism. In 1955, Richard Hofstadter and Walter P. Metzka concluded that in almost two thirds of the cases of academic freedom that came to the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, turned out to be not ideological at all, but personal. A professor or administrator used charges of communism or the much vaguer ones available, such as Pinko, fellow traveler, anti anti communist. They used those charges to make trouble for an unloved colleague. As Hofstadter later put it, in this crusade, communism was the weapon, not the target. The targets often included philosophy departments. One of the most hateful things about communism to Americans was its atheism. Where the associations of Jews, African-Americans, homosexuals, and feminists with communism were largely mythical, communist, communism itself had long trumpeted its atheism and opposition to religion. In a country as religious as the United States, this was a key aspect of communism's general hatefulness and may even have been the key element. In the words of religious scholar and historian Mark Toulouse, there was in America, quote, a deep-seated belief that the Cold War represented a religious battle more than a political one. In chapter one of my 2016, the philosophy scare, I documented how this made special problems for philosophy departments. Philosophy was considered to be the only field in which the existence of God might come under question. Only place in the university. For example, 
1947 appointment of Max Otto. I talk about this in the book, a preeminent pre pragmatist and a former president of the American Philosophical Association Central Division. UCLA tried to appoint him to a visiting professorship in the philosophy department. The appointment was withdrawn after the philosophy department received a couple of hundred letters protesting this hiring. Now, Otto had no association with left-wing politics. I mean, he was a progressive, but he was not, uh, not at all organized about communism or anything. He had been the subject of an admiring profile in Time magazine, which was hardly a left-wing rag. And they loved him. What agitated the letter writers was not communism. In 1947, most, most people, a lot of people, still thought we were friends with the Russians. What agitated them was his atheism. Several of the letter writers take care to explain that they would have no problem if Otto were appointed in any other department. But in philosophy, to quote one letter, he would have a chance to teach his atheism. Notice the inability to distinguish teaching from indoctrination. Right? Otto said, uh, personally, in the, in the article that exposed him, it was an article in the Los Angeles Examiner, first newspaper in, in Los Angeles, that said atheists to be hired to teach in UCLA philosophy department. And Otto was quoted right in that article saying, it's not about me, it's about getting the students to think for themselves and develop their own philosophy. Well, that just didn't register at all. Teaching is indoctrination. The letter writers, letter protesters in uh, Los Angeles were not the only ones to be exercised about atheistic philosophy professors. Bertrand Russell's 1940 appointment to a professorship at CUNY, City College of New York, uh, City University of New York, was challenged on grounds of his atheism and his sexual libertinism. He had apparently arrived to take up his job with a woman to whom he was not married. Uh, so he had, there are two charges against him, atheism and corruption of the young. And as Russell was quite happy to point out, those are the same charges that have been made against Socrates. One of the arguments used by Russell's defenders was that he had been appointed to teach logic and mathematics, not metaphysics, or ethics. But the judge who decided the case, John E. McGeehan, ruled otherwise on, on an interesting basis. He said, it has been argued that he is going to teach mathematics. His appointment, however, is to the Department of Philosophy. So there again, the fact that he's in a philosophy department makes him more suspect than if he had been hired by mathematics. Concerns about atheistic philosophy professors did not wholly die out when the, the ruckus of the Cold War died down. The 2014 film, God's Not Dead, the title right there tells you something. It tells the story of Jeffrey Radisson, an atheistic philosophy professor who gets his comeuppance when he is fatally injured by a car. He discovers that he's dying, but God's not dead. Radisson requires his students at the beginning of the movie to sign a declaration that God is dead in order to pass his course, which may surpass the equation of teaching with indoctrination that was there in the Max Otto day, you know, 40 years before. Though widely reviled by film critics, this film grossed $64 million in the United States. I think it cost about $2 million to make and has inspired three sequels, the most recent in 2021. So it's out there, you know, they don't show it in major cultural centers, but it's out there in the little theaters and the little towns. So that's kind of what happened in a nutshell. Uh, it never really went away. Today, I'm interested not in Rousselian philosophy or in pragmatism, but in continental philosophy. It is noteworthy in this regard, the turn to philosophy now, that the very term continental philosophy came into vogue in the late 60s and early 70s, just about the midpoint of the Cold War. And as is often noted, the term began 
as an American one. European thinkers did not consider themselves to be continental philosophers. They just called themselves philosophers. My Cold War pressures in America have played a role in the history of continental philosophy. This question presupposes that con continental philosophy has a unified history. But that is at first glance anyway, doubtful. Simon Critchley has put the standard view of the matter clearly. He says, continental philosophy is a highly eclectic and disparate series of intellectual currents that could hardly be said to amount to a unified tradition. There is simply no category that would begin to cover the diversity of work produced by thinkers as methodologically and thematically opposed as Hegel and Kierkegaard, Freud and Martin Buber, Heidegger and Theodor Adorno, as Jacques Lacan and Deleuze. Though affinities with and critiques of other thinkers are certainly to be found in the works of continental philosophers, on Critchley's view, they are not intrinsic to it because there is no overall development, no unified tradition in which later philosophers critically learn from earlier ones so as to develop some common standpoint or project. So continental philosophy on this view is fascinating and diverse, but as a whole, it's just incoherent. It doesn't hang together. Uh, Standard narratives of the development of continental philosophy also often fail of completeness. Unlike Critchley's account, which begins from German idealism, which I think is the right place to begin, they begin with Husserl. That is how I learned it as a student and graduate student in the 60s and 70s. And as recently as last May, Peter Salmon in an extraordinarily brilliant survey published in Aeon, calls Husserl's thought the, quote, origin story, unquote, of continental philosophy. But beginning with Husserl means leaving out a number of pre-Husserlian thinkers, who it seems might be included, ought to be included. Hegel, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche come to mind. Papers on them are regularly given at SPEP, the American Continental Society, the largest one. But apparently they don't really belong there. So why, I used to wonder in my youthful days, are they hanging around? What are they doing here? Who invited them? How come they don't go away? Nietzsche, Hegel, Kierkegaard, those guys. Now coherence and completeness are two important criteria for evaluating histories or narratives in general. Unless there is some coherence in the development, you don't have a story at all. Failures of completeness are often morally condemnable. We all know about the women and people of color who are left out of standard histories. While Hegel, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche are hardly hidden figures, to use the title of the 2016 movie about the role of black women in the American space program, they are certainly excluded from the origin story of continental philosophy. Why? Why does continental philosophy originate with Husserl? Well, here's a thought experiment. Imagine that you are back in the 1950s and you want to introduce to a nation whose chosen mission is a global struggle against communist atheism, the newest philosophical sensation in Europe existentialism. What do you do about the fact that the most influential existentialists, Beauvoir, Camus, Sartre, are not only atheists, but loud atheists, who insist that atheism is central to their entire philosophies? If an eminent pragmatist like Max Otto was unhirable, what do we do about these people? Uh, so about just a, something in passing, Sartre, I mean, to see how visible Sartre's, Sartre's atheistic red flag was. I remember walking down the street in Claremont, California, where I was attending college in 1964. 
and seeing in a vending box the banner headline of the early edition of the Los Angeles Times for October 21st of that year and screamed at me in huge letters, atheist declines Nobel Prize. Well, that's all you needed to know about Sartre was that he was an atheist and had declined the Nobel Prize. So yeah, a little thought experiment, what would you do? We don't have to imagine, we don't have to have a thought experiment. There is someone who was actually in that position. Princeton philosophy professor, Walter Kaufmann, who in the 1956 introduction to his anthology, Existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre, Kaufman says that the main obstacle to the acceptance of existentialism in American philosophy departments was its atheism. And he talks, he says that, he doesn't explain it. Two strategies I think were developed for handling this problem. The problem of how you sell a, an atheistic approach to Americans. One problem was Kaufman's own. There are two types of existentialism, he claims in his book theistic and atheistic. The atheist branch includes thinkers like Sartre and Beauvoir. The theistic branch includes the first existentialist, Kierkegaard, as well as Dostoevsky, as well as more rotten, more recent thinkers such as Gabriel Marcel and Karl Jaspers, both of whom I note are less influential than their atheistic confreres then and now and neither of whom regarded himself as an existentialist. So Kaufman's atheism problem, in any case, is solved. He's, he may have had to muscle things around a bit, but he solved his problem. Existentialism itself is not intrinsically atheistic, no matter what its most prominent proponents say. As European philosophy moved beyond existentialism to become continental, Another strategy took the place of Kaufmann's. The atheism problem persisted, as you can see from a quick listing of central figures of post-Kantian European philosophy, all the way through the Cold War. Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Husserl, Heidegger, Sartre, Beauvoir, Camus, Adorno, Derrida, Hugo, Deleuze, none is a traditional theist. Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Deleuze are ambiguous, I think. Whatever divinity they believe in, if any, is, not, is clearly not the traditional God. The others are either open atheists or hold views that are clearly incompatible with traditional religious belief. Deconstruction, for example, does not exempt God from its denial of ultimate significance. And Foucault's emphasis on disciplinary determinism in this dark period, he called it, uh, leaves no room for an active deity. Only one figure on this list is clearly compatible with traditional religious belief. Husserl, whose phenomenology claims to be neutral as between idealism and materialism, but which explaining consciousness entirely in terms of itself, tends towards idealism, as Husserl later recognized. Given the American political climate of the times, it would not be surprising that Husserl should have been proclaimed what I learned him to be at the time, the funds et origo of continental philosophy. The political motive for this treatment of Husserl is clear. If all continental philosophy derives from Husserl, then once again, its atheism becomes not an intrinsic feature, but a strangely recurrent temptation of various geniuses. So let us now, without denying the quality and importance of Husserl's philosophy, just remove him from the list of continental philosophers. It quickly becomes evident and I wrote a long book to support it, Time and Philosophy, 2011, that all the others share a single basic doctrine, that anything philosophers can talk about is in time, i.e. came to be from something else, 
and will eventually pass over into something else. This view, which I will call TPO, Temporality of Philosophical Objects, dates at least to Kant, who made time a condition of cognition, while reason for him remained atemporal and so non-cognitive. The instatement of Husserl as the origin story of continental philosophy explains why it has remained so strangely indefinable. Trying to define the common project of Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Husserl, Heidegger, Sartre, and the rest is like trying to define the common project of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Benedict XVI, and Jimmy Carter. As long as Benedict is on the list, a common project is hard to imagine. Take him out, and it becomes obvious that it's a list of presidents of the United States. But then, if you pursue this, you have to bring Marx in, because he certainly accepted TPO. Consider his characterization of dialectics early in Capital. Capital. It includes, he writes, in its comprehension an affirmative recognition of the existing state of things, also the recognition of the negation of the state, of its inevitable breaking up, because such thought regards every historically developed scene, uh, sorry, social form, as in fluid movement, and hence takes into account its transient nature, no less than its momentary existence. Uh, so that's. Uh, that's from Marx and the, the notable temporal terms that are just packed into that. Capitalism for Marx is doomed because everything is doomed. The question is what specifically dooms it, and which Marx diagnoses is the opposition, or as he says, the contradiction, the Yiddish book, between workers and owners. If the other European philosophers were unacceptable because in their atheism they sounded faintly like Marx, now Marx himself demands inclusion. Joe McCarthy, always anti-intellectual, would have loved it. But you had to find a way to get Marx out and Husserl in. Once that happens, once Husserl is removed and Marx is inserted, continental philosophy uh, ceases to be a mere congeries of geniuses and becomes a coherent enterprise in which later figures learn critically from earlier ones, a true tradition, whose story I tell in my time in philosophy. It is doubtful in general that we should call that tradition by the always embarrassingly geographical term continental. Perhaps temporal or temporalized philosophy would, would be a better name. When we see that TPO is basic to most continental philosophy, we can come up with a history of it that is both more complete and more coherent than standard narratives. Hegel, responding to problems in Kant, is the first modern philosopher not to appeal to the atemporality of anything. Truth for him in the phenomenology of spirit is merely the result of a process of inquiry, which begins with a certainty and give his height, which is refuted and then gives rise to a lie, to a truth. That's just how it works, which then becomes the certainty for the next section and then is refuted in turn. Uh, it, it doesn't turn out to be untrue. It, it, uh, truth is to, if truth is to be true is to have a certain sort of past for Hegel. But Hegel refuses, so he, he introduces time into philosophy in that way. Truth is related to the uh, relation to the past. But he refuses to talk about the future. I mean, he just won't do it. He says, you know, uh, you don't even know you have a future. <laughs> you may drop dead in the next minute. Well, that's a good way of ending the discussion. Marx attempts, and so you get a series of attempts to talk about the future. Marx attempts to predict it. That didn't go well. Kierkegaard recognizes it as unintelligible. It's eternity. I, you can't understand it. Uh, Nietzsche embraces this unintelligibility, uh, or what he calls Untergang, uh, 
and so on down to Derrida, who also emphasizes the openness of the future. In his interview with Giovanna Borgori about the terrorist attacks of 9-11, Derrida says, uh, what is unacceptable about bin Laden and so forth, quote, is not only the cruelty, the disregard for human life, the disrespect for law, for women, the use of what is worse to neo capital or techno capitalist modernity for the purpose of a religious fanaticism. No, it is above all the fact that such actions and such discourse open on to no future. And in my view, have no future. It's a pretty strong thing to say. Of all the horrible things you can say about bin Laden and his type, the worst is that his way of doing things allows for no future. I'll spare you further details about the coherent development of Carnot philosophy over the last two centuries. I'll just note that the book I wrote about them is 393 pages long, so not to go into today. Among the questions that this, moves to temper, this move to temporality answers is that of the recurrent atheism of continental philosophers. Since God is eternal and philosophers can only talk about temporal things, you cannot talk philosophically about God, who remains removed from philosophical intelligibility. Some continental philosophers, barred in this way from direct talk about God, talk instead about something which philosophy encounters, but which remains unfathomable to it, such as Heidegger's being, Derrida's difference, and Kierkegaard's God. I mean, he calls it God, but it's pretty weird. Others take the temporal emphasis a step further and just deny the existence of God altogether. And still others, such as, such as uh, Jean-Luc Marion, use categories developed in continental philosophy, but no, revealingly, specifically Husserl, largely Husserl, to talk about a more traditional, though still usually hyper-transcendent God. But it is hard, though not impossible, to be both a continental philosopher and a theist. It has a push against, a, against theism. In the context of the Cold War, this made it hard to justify publicly hiring continental philosophers uh, justified to the, the, the public. American philosophy departments themselves often did their best. The philosophy chair at the University of Minnesota, this should be remembered, it's not, it should be remembered. The philosophy chair at the University of Minnesota ruined his health trying to defend Forrest Wiggins, the first African-American to be hired in a major American philosophy department. He ruined his health and Wiggins was fired anyway. So who can blame philosophy departments for avoiding such hires altogether or minimizing them. One way to justify such a hire, if you wanted to, was to point out that post-Kantian European thought was extremely influential the world over. And American students should know something about it. After all, medical, school, medical schools study anthrax and cancer. Why can't American universities study continental philosophy? But on this approach, teaching continental philosophy is justified because it is carried on somewhere else, over there, on a continent, which is not named, but it's certainly not North America. It's what the British call the continent, namely Europe. This in turn encouraged continental thinkers in America to produce many expositions and commentaries on European thinkers rather than pursuing original work of their own, a trait which, as philosophers will testify, persists to this day. I know people who've published an anthology of their writings on problems uh, because they were tired of being told that all the original work is done in Europe. It is not that continental philosophy is better understood by seeing the centrality to, to, to it of TPO. Omitting TPO not only makes the overall tradition difficult to understand, but hinders our understanding even of the individual thinkers who make it up. 
This is because since everything continental philosophers can talk about is in time, they have no his transhistorical standards uh, by which to legitimate their own approach. They can't say that their approach is the right one because it adheres to timeless standards like truth and logical correctness. People like Hume do that, Kant does that, dogmatism and skepticism, uh, lots of people do that. Continentals can't. The best they can do is to at least say they're doing better than their predecessors. In other words, it's getting better with time. As Marx proudly says, proudly says, that he has turned Hegel on his feet, or as Derrida claims, that he has deconstructed the undue privilege that Heidegger gives to the word being. Such criticisms of earlier philosophers are not merely clever asides or obito dicta. They are the ways in which, the main ways, in which continental philosophers define and legitimate themselves. The, the individual geniuses who constitute the canon of continental philosophy thus cannot be understood, let alone taught, apart from the larger tradition from which they come. Seeing continental philosophy as centered on TPO also enables us to see a substantive contrast between continental and analytical philosophy. Analytical philosophy, I suggest, differs from continental philosophy, not merely stylistically, as a lot of people say, but in that, as Quine said, it takes an atemporal approach. Here's a quote from Quine. Our unordinary language, I love this, I love the way he writes, I just love it. Our ordinary language shows a tiresome bias in its treatment of time. Relations of date are exalted grammatically as relations of position, weight, and color are not. This bias is of itself an inelegance or breach of theoretical simplicity. Hence, in fashioning canonical notations, it is usual to drop tense distinctions. We may conveniently hold to the grammatical present as a form, but treat it as temporally neutral, where the artifice comes in is in taking the present tense as timeless always. I love that timeless always, think about that. And dropping other tenses. Quine's bias is continental philosophy's basis. Recognizing this might expect allow us to begin what has been so embarrassingly lacking in philosophy for the last half century, uh, serious genuine dialogue between continental and analytical philosophy. There is however, a price to be paid for all this. If what I have said here and elsewhere is right, analytical philosophy was distorted in the United States by political pressures of the McCarthy era or what I'd now call the American Cold War. And I think a case can be made that without those pressures, analytical philosophy in the United States would have had a healthier development than it has had. But continental philosophy as we know it, as a congeries of geniuses, somehow beginning from Husserl, was created by those pressures. Without those pressures of the Cold War, analytical philosophy would be different, but continental philosophy would not exist at all. So that's the place. Thank you very much. I'm done. Yes, thank you very much for